Namaste and welcome friends. Here we are again another week with each other. Another chapter, another section of this wonderful book with eyes to see. When we left each other last week, we were going through some of the parables in the Bible and looking at them from a different perspective, uh, metaphorically, symbolically, rather than literally, to see if we might gain deeper meaning uh, from them. You may be, you may not, but at least it's an exercise in seeing what you have available to you to live a deeper, richer, more textured life. And so we continue that today with the parable about the wedding feast, the story of the wedding feast. The wedding feast at Cana is most often portrayed as a, another example of Jesus' miracles, the changing of water into wine. In the midst of the wedding celebration, it appears that all the wine has been consumed by the festive crowd. After overhearing the father of the bridegroom telling Jesus' mother Mary that there was no more wine for the guest, Jesus says that the cupbearer knows there is still more wine. So the, so the guests drank to their hearts content of wine, even finer than the first. You have kept the the best wine until the end of the feast. Other hosts do not do so, the guests are, are to have said. Water turned into wine. Let us examine the story from a different perspective, uh, that is, symbolically, or the wedding feast is a metaphor. The, the wedding celebration is truly one of unity, but rather than thinking of the wedding as a unity between only two people, let us think as a term wedding as a symbolic representation of the unity of relationship, starting with the unity of our relationship with our highest self. We are not speaking here of relationship in a casual, superficial sense. We are speaking of relationship demonstrated by the deepest levels of passionate sharing of love. Not passionate in terms of sexual passion, but passion that is the finest example of rapture, bliss, joy, and the peaceful centeredness of divine unity. It is a relationship found not on genital eros, but on spiritual eros, the deep unconditional love of it on a vertical level, and that same love in relationship with other entities on the horizontal level, epitomized as compassion. <clears throat> Pardon me. Such unity is the ultimate expression of love among and between humans in their most open and fullest form of relatedness. It is a passionate sharing in the full image of love and humanity as, you guessed it, one. In this sense, then, the mystic loses her or himself and becomes the passion itself, becomes the fruit of the vine, the juice of the grape, flowing as the finest wine of love. In this form, love transcends bliss. Love becomes the deepest inner relationship within oneself and flows outwardly in relatedness with all else. It is oneness personified. When I give my total presence to another person, I quickly and completely forget myself. And if the other does the same, in that moment, in that very moment, we are filled with peace and loving relatedness. Even if the other does not correspond in this fashion, I am still in loving relatedness, for I have forgotten myself in favor of another, and that is my only charge. When one do, what one does with my loving ways is none of my business. As long as I treat love this, love this way, I am spiritually fulfilled, even if my ego disagrees, for I am reading for I am living authentically. Jesus, the finest example of love is the way, was a lover of such tenderness and depth. As portrayed in Jesus, Son of Man, Khalil Gibran speaks of Jesus this way. His heart was a wine press. You and I could approach with a cup and drink therefrom. Should we so choose, you and I can drink a long, sweet draft of love's nectar, the epitome of love, and partake in this relationship, a love fully given, openly taken, thoroughly enjoyed, completely embodied, freely expressed. 
The depth of such love far surpasses that which we display so conveniently as relationships in our day-to-day helter-skelter existence. The more we give ourselves in compassionate love, the greater the quality of fruit in our wine press. The finer, more mature, more full-bodied is the resulting wine of relationship. In this story, the water, being of less body than the wine, symbolizes the relatively superficial, simply emotional sharing of love among the guests, much like life in today's materialistic, objectified entrapment. That is, until Jesus himself fully engages the guests in the telling of stories, enchanting them with his visions and examples of love personified. The guests easily forgot their own ways of relating, portrayed as the earlier wine, having deteriorated into the watered-down version of a tired, listless relatedness as the evening wore on. The symbolism could even speak to relationships taken for granted, expressed as but a superficial quality, superficial quality of union, much as those in a tired marriage remain civil but cease to search for the past to another's heart. Nevertheless, the wedding guest's involvement, the forgetting and losing of self into her deeper union with love, that was Jesus, made them drink of that real love, the finest of all the wines from Jesus' wine press. As Khalil Gibran writes, the spirit of Jesus of Nazareth is the best and the oldest wine, meaning, of course, that the age-old knowing of the deepest love is the oldest, the best, the richest wine. The cupbearers, each of the guests, knew in their hearts there was better wine to consume, to share, but characteristically chose to drink earlier wine, the relationships of their own making. The best wine was kept for last, the wine of Jesus' own wine press, the purest love from his own heart, and all filled their cups for as long as they chose to remain in relationship of this magnitude. We get another clue of the real dimensions of the kind of love Jesus represented from the volume of water he changed into wine. There were six jars, it is said, each capable of holding 20 to 30 gallons of wine. Can you imagine some 120 to 180 gallons of wine for a wedding celebration, especially after they had already consumed plenty? Symbolically, the multiples of three that is six, mean the magnitude of completeness. Numerically, it is a symbolic sign of the extravagance of Jesus' love, actually of love, period. As an example to us, it says we are to love extravagantly, unbashedly, fully with the love we all are. It's quite a difference from the ways we usually see love conveyed in our shyness, reticence, self-consciousness, fearful of what others may think or worse yet say about our display of love. Loving extravagantly takes a letting go of our egocentric self-centeredness and the willingness to give with all we have, regardless of the outcome. And by the way, it's none of our business when anyone thinks about us. Ours is only to be. We are responsible only for the giving not for the results of doing so. Loving spiritually just is and has no other requirements or expectations tied to it, none whatsoever. It is complete in its extravagance. Again, what perspective or experience we give to our life is our own choice. From my own experience, I know that when I separate myself from another in relationship or when I resist any form of communication, I then feel guilty about not having been more decent or shameful that I was so lacking in sensitivity to another's needs. On the other hand, the way of the heart, love, is Jesus' way by whatever name. It is the ultimate example of unity, the unity of which love speaks so fervently. By living spiritually, we recondition ourselves from being judgmental towards self and others and things which keep us apart. By living spiritually, by serving as mediators for the Christ essence, that is, love's way, 
We ultimately grow to shed the shroud of guilt and shame and fear that emanate from a life of separation. Envision with me, if you will, envision with me, if you will, the image of Jesus simply standing before you in all his glory. His eyes rimmed with tears of compassion. See Jesus as his heart, the wine pressed, open to flow of limitless spiritual love. See his heart as a spigot, with his love flowing into your cup as you ask to heal your brokenness. See your cup overflowing with the extravagant love of life, healing you as you sip from it. Now see anyone else in your life, perhaps someone with whom you have difficulty relating. Envision that person's heart just as you did Jesus' heart. Look down at your own, made in that same image, and visualize each of you drinking from the spigot of the other's wine press of authentic love, lavishing it, as it were, one upon the other. Feel the healing taking place. Feel the healing power of love's spirit. Feel the freedom from fear and guilt and shame that filled you in your brokenness. Feel the joy in your heart. Just think of what this life could be like if everyone imagined and lived the same image of what life is. The lavish, reciprocal arrangement of drinking from one's, one another's wine press of love spirit. What a different world this would be. Share this vision, and it will be. The literal translation of the word leaves us with Jesus doing all as our example. And if we somehow determine the example is too difficult for us to follow, guilt or shame is sure to follow. On the other hand, the spiritual transition, trans, translation transforms our expressions into the creations of love we already are, much as Jesus was a personal transfiguration of spiritual love. We are created in love's image and thus ourselves become, that is, return to, that image in its most complete manifestation, the innate truth of authentic love. Jesus wanted us not to imitate his miracles, but to be the miracles. For all of the miracles attributed to Jesus are portrayals of love and his transformational power in each of us. This message is given to us in story after story after story until we are aware of, understand, remember, and live the message of the way of love we truly are that most of us have forgotten we are. Another story. Give away your treasures and follow me. Oh, we know that one, don't we? In Matthew, Jesus says, in essence, that whoever gives of his or her earthly treasures and follows him will have eternal life. Such things as our families, our property, our material goods, even our beliefs and opinions, all give us pleasure or comfort make us feel secure and give us our current perspectives on life. Why then would Jesus ask us to give these things up to follow him? Surely we can follow Jesus, can live a healthy life and still maintain these earthly treasures, can we not? Is Jesus really asking us to give up these things? Do these things symbolize something else we must give up if we are follow him to be truly loving? Let us, once again, take Jesus' teachings in the context of our inner life. When we place our understanding and knowing in this context, we come to see that leaving our parents and family behind means to live their influence on us, their expectations, their imprint on us behind. Unless we come to see them in the shadow of our being, these images come to control we see life and how we act. They cloud our own inner reality with their ways, which become our gods, our inner treasures. Other treasures we have take, we come to take as our own are our prejudices, our fears, our judgments, our envy, our anger, and it goes. You can name your own images in the privacy of your sanctuary. Their familiarity and our reliance on them makes them our treasures in a world of ego consciousness. Admit it or not, we embrace these for fear we will have nothing to sustain us and their loss. 
Better to know and depend on them, we think, for they have served to get us from one point in life to another. In honoring them, we must honor our feelings of loss when we decide to go let go of them, properly grieving the separation that causes pain. But we must let go of them to witness our brokenness and the love life sends our way. When we commit to letting go in trust and faith, those around us will show us love. By the way, that was the sound of a helicopter you may have heard. It's taking away the things we no longer need. <laughs> Timely, huh? When we commit to letting go in trust and faith, those around us will show us love, will not judge us, will listen faithfully to our story, will tend to our needs, will heal with us on our journey. Symbolically, this is the story of Jesus' life and its example, its example for us. When we decide to give away our treasures and live our brokenness in the gift of another's living spirit is our way of life. It becomes a life of eternal healing. The joy and peace and comfort of such living far surpasses the giving living in the illusions of our treasures. Several examples of such miracles are found in the next chapter. Give away all your treasures and come with me, Jesus said. Give away all your inner demons and live the fullness of your divine life and others instead. And you shall receive a hundred times as much in return and shall have eternal life. We need not fear giving up these trusted treasures, so to speak. We, not, we need not be alone in doing so. To be sure, we may feel the fear of failure, not knowing how even to begin. But there are many around us who have taken the initiative to do so, and are witnesses to the fact that not only can it be done, but successfully so. There are increasing numbers of programs, workshops, seminars, and retreats led by competent people who can guide you on your journey. There are programs to heal your inner child or family tree, or healing through prayer and love's way meaning authentic love through play and creativity, ways of contemplative prayer, caring of the soul, finding our life vision, directed in silent retreats, and more. Inquire and you'll be surprised at the programs and support you will find available. Seek and ye shall find, but seek first, ye must. Uh, the next story is about miracles. Throughout the Bible, stories of the miracles of Jesus abound. The changing of water to wine at the wedding feast at Cana, the healing of the blind man Bartimaeus, the raising of Lazarus from the dead, the healing at the, of the cripple alongside the pool of water. It is said that Jesus made the blind to see, the deaf to hear, the paralyzed and crippled to walk, and drove demons from the insane. Miracle after miracle, after miracle. If we hold these miracles as only literally true, their impact on our spiritual development is greatly diminished. Likewise, by holding Jesus to the only miracle worker, we severely limit ourselves from doing even greater works than these, as Jesus said we can and will. But first we need to define what we mean by miracles from a non-literal perspective. For example, Instead of a physical impairment, might not blindness be dark thoughts or hardened preconceptions on any given issue, or other ways of thinking that are self-limiting, attitudinally, attitudinally negative or narrow, judgmental or self-righteous? Any, any of these perspectives can blind us to other, more loving viewpoints. They can keep us only at the surface of relationships with ourselves, others, and things and can render us blind to the ways of spiritual love, the only true love. They are, they are infirmities of spirit. If we choose to experience events as negative, or to be humiliated or embarrassed, or somehow demeaned, life itself will also be negative to our way of thinking. If, on the other hand, we choose to know in our heart of hearts that we are the innate essence of love, and we manifest our lives and see others the same way, then we give what we truly are to all life sends us. Knowing that, the pure of heart see right past the negative act of another, right into his or her own heart, thus forming the image only of the love that he or she actually is. 
This perspective permits the perpetrator to be seen in his, her or his divine innocence and thus to be freed from the need for forgiveness before any act is even committed. To see in this fashion sheds new light on those shadows we have buried that we've kept that have kept us blinded to the ways of love. And we suddenly have eyes with which to see and do in fact really see, perhaps for the very first time since birth or early childhood. Our new way of seeing demonstrates its sacred nature. Life becomes sacred for me when I remember to see others for their innate essence of love rather than the result of some kind of learning I don't approve of. In that context, both the moment and the other person are sacred and nothing else matters. Is that not the real secret of creating miracles? And what of a crippled nature? Cannot a withered or otherwise deformed limb be a metaphor for an attitude of idleness, laziness, self-centeredness, or any character defect or flaw for that matter? An idle mind breathes an idle body, it is said. A mind bent on loving ways, on giving up oneself less lead to another or to a just cause, quickens the heart and limbs to perform that which one must. Freedom becomes not the power to do what one wants out of emotion or self-indulgence, but the power to do what one must out of love. The Spirit moves us and we are free. Fully energized by our joy-filled heart, we cast our mental and emotional crutches aside and set about our business of loving in the purest form of love possible. In the form of a new perspective, our thought of withered limbs has provided the spark of life which mobilizes us into action. The crippled has thus been healed. Have we all been paralyzed by our limited thinking on a given issue? When I see myself of being incapable, threatened, or intimidated in a situation, I tend to freeze. I am paralyzed in my thinking and in my ability to move on any front. When I remember to breathe and go inside my fear of the situation, the fear invariably returns to love. My sanity is restored, and both my enthusiasm and ability to move forward with dispatch reappear. And death? What is death, you may ask? Physically, our bodies can age, wither away, suffer, and cease to function. We read about physical birth and death. We read about physical birth and death in an earlier section of this book. Metaphorically, to be dead is to be unaware of the quickening of the loving spirit, to be asleep in a life teeming with opportunities for enthusiastic expression of love's many renderings, to be numb to the divine passion that inspires within. We are numb, indeed deadened, by the constant bombardment of sounds and sights, interminable messages from all the vast array of media, false expectations, improper demands, abuse of all kinds. On and on and on it goes. Ultimately, we succumb to these external forces and take on mere coping as our way of life. Instead of recognizing these intrusions on our serenity and going within to deal with them in the sanctity of our heart, with our loving essence that renews. A, ch a challenge, it seems to me, is to be able to define and live serenely in a way that finds peace not without these intrusions, but within them, in spite of them. When I find myself struggling, just coping with life, I know I am out of sync with living what I truly am. When I take just a moment in the middle of confusion or a struggle to center myself, I see life from an entirely different perspective, and heaven reappear, uh, reappears yet again. This takes continuous practice, and like anything else, it is remembrance of the need that starts practice on its way. It is a remembrance of our innate nature of love which returns us to loving. Remembrance is the catalyst which sets us free. A spiritual director once said to me that our purpose in life is to be fully aware and to live like one who is. Unfortunately, our planet is inhabited by many who live money, power, and control as their primary sources of satisfaction, affirmation, and validation. The kinds of messages we receive from such people 
<coughs> pardon me, place demands and expectations on us that fit only a world in a daze. The, the abuse inflicted on us is seen by the perpetrators as their way of guiding us to success, their success, or at least their definition of success, and our demise. If we permit ourselves to be numbed or deadened to these conditions and their impact on our lives, something or someone must issue the alert, the alarm that tells us that we have gone awry. From my observation, the inner voice that speaks in silence is that alarm, that alert that calls to us. Sometimes that inner voice calls ever so gently, and others quite abruptly, to show us that we need to pay more attention to our interior condition. If we open the doors of our hearts but a crack, heaven's trumpets will blare for us to test our heart's condition, to reinitiate our healing journey. And healing, by the way, of course, by now you know it means it changes. Just to change our perspective is, is a healing. When we have heard the call, the people and circumstances, circumstances begin to appear as miracles in our lives, sending us further and further onto our recovery, toward our remembering with the life of lovers. Love indeed appears on our doorstep in the hands and hearts of caring humans, says Robert Browning and Fra Lippo Lippi, God lends us for each other that way. Divine presence expressed with and through other human counterparts reestablishes life as a perpetual garden of remembering it is. If we treat life as a perpetual garden of sorts, we can learn to take on the perspective of its soul and soul, as so you will, purpose is for providing opportunities for remembering to return to the loving essence we are. No matter what shows up in our garden, even if it looks for a moment like a weed, it is for our benefit. No matter what shows up it is for our growth, its means are to bring us to the single end of love. Each event, each person, each object or circumstance, no matter what the appearance, birth, death, and everything in between is for the single purpose of moving us toward our ultimate goal, providing we choose to see it that way, of course. And that's, of course, what this book is about. All we need to do is ask, how will this best serve me in remembering what I am? How is this serving my highest good and the highest good of the person I am now communicating with? The answers will nourish this new way of seeing the events that used to disturb us become our friends, our tools for learning about ourselves, rather than infringements upon self-restricted boundaries. We can then, we can be cripples or we can be free from impairment. The working of miracles is entirely of our own making. And the insane? If we are not dead to the world, many of us are rendered at the very least insane living the illusions of this world rather than loving reality, which is our birthright and the only sane way for us. The idle mind, the ego-centered persistence of serving self or insistence on playing the political games of life can indeed become mind-boggling, restless, paranoid, manipulating, objectifying, devils of the mind. Such demons manifest themselves regularly as physical, psychic, and or spiritual acts of abuse, of unkindness toward ourselves, others, and things, whatever finds itself in our path. A change of mind focus, as it were, not at all like attitude focus, does wonders to render one sane in an insane world. For a time it will be difficult for our mind to accept the real truth rather than the more familiar illusions that living in such a materialistic world perpetuate. But as fear of living in one's reality is conquered, the once warped mind finds solace and truth for itself, and sanity is restored. You can bet on it. We can also come to our standing of unconditional love by the perception of its opposite in yet another familiar form, fear. This too can have its power over us. It can render us insane. Fear is the greatest of these demons, and all kinds of insidious ways 
Fear keeps us from moving forward. Fear seduces us into staying in places and relationships that are inappropriate for us. It keeps us from playing the truth to both ourselves and others. It blocks us from standing up to bullies and others who abuse us. It keeps us in jobs which have long since passed their usefulness. It keeps us from even the simplest decisions. For fear is, is being either wrong, for fear of being either wrong or right. It keeps us from acting in the simplicity of kindness, fearing we will be stepped on, abandoned, or rejected yet one more time. Prolonged suppressed fear turns into depression, sending us to bed in an escape from the decisions and changes we must face within ourselves. Eventually, it can even coax us to end life in this body. Fear blinds us, cripples us, makes us think we're going crazy. It deadens our spirit. Fear is a killer, and it keeps us from dealing justly, loving, lo lovingly with ourselves and with others. If we examine our behavior closely, we will realize that life is administered in two basic ways, out of fear or out of love. If we so administer justice, if we administer justice out of fear, we do so with condemnation, punishment, bondage, and death, cri crippling perspectives to be sure. On the other hand, when justice is administered out of an attitude of love, we do so with forgiveness, freedom, growth, and love. As J. Sig Paulson put in his piece, The Miracles of Forgiveness, fear fights, error, and retaliates, love forgives, and regenerates judgment or love to learn to be fear or love well let's uh stop there for today there's plenty more where that came from for sure we're about in the middle of the book now so we're progressing nicely uh that works well uh so uh let's just take that Listen to it again if you want. Get the book. Read it if you want. Whatever is best for you. Trust what your heart is telling you in that situation. And uh, you, you won't be able to do wrong. Okay. Uh, that'll do it for today. Except for the post that I want to share with you. I like to do this at the end. Just giving you a little nugget to chew on. Perhaps with a friend over coffee or a drink. And you can take them into the conversation. <laughs> Take them then into a conversation. Excuse me for not unplugging my phone. I just did. So here's the post. If you don't love yourself, you'll always be chasing after people who don't love you either. A person by the name of Mandy Hale wrote that. I'll say it again. If you don't love yourself, you'll always be chasing after people who don't love you either. So love thyself. Love thyself, my friends. I hope you have a wonderful week between now and the next time we meet. I hope you know you, you are love personified. Namaste, my friends. I love you.